welcome. I wanted to take a moment to honor uh, or to acknowledge the 50th anniversary of the death of Martin Luther King Jr., one of the greatest poets of justice we have known. I've been reading a lot of James Baldwin's work recently and was struck by something he said about another great leader, Malcolm X, that his revolution was to love. Quote, what made him unfamiliar and dangerous, Baldwin observes, was not his hatred for white people, but his love for blacks. It was a kind of revolution, the bold bestowing of that love. It takes such a, this is not Baldwin now, <laughs> though we share the same birthday. It takes such a long time to love oneself, particularly in a society that teaches us to alternately despise and worship where we meet the mirror. And even when at long last society relents, if indeed it does, those dates in history, as one author has put it, don't always agree with our transformations. Tonight we are in the presence of two authors born in the very same year, circa 1971. <laughs> I was born in 1971 too, so there was something good, good going on. Um, let me repeat. Tonight we are in the presence of two authors born in the same year whose transformations, while of course continual, have come to their most fully articulated fruition and blossoming in, the, in their late 40s, midway through the journey of life. While others might be out, and forgive me, uh, doing the literary equivalent of buying a Porsche to appease a midlife crisis, I'm really not sure where I got that from, uh, Stephanie Burt is writing exuberantly of trans ams, emphasis on trans and am, and trans animals and trans beings. In a recent FAS diversity, I can only call it pep talk, <laughs> that they assign us, um, Bert described with great candor and insight and compassion the process of coming out to herself in four stages over almost as many decades and chronicled how gradually, quote, the hard work of appearances disappeared. In her book, Advice from the Lights, she has vigilantly and vulnerably and downright jubilantly documented those morphic stages of mind and body. In so doing, Bert has involved us as her teaching so often does, not only in her inimitable knowing, her poems in this collection often begin with the epitome of knowing, the epigram, but also in her updated status of unknowing. She is at one and the same time, as she recently said in, in a TLS article, quote, an adult in a position of authority, a tenured professor, say, and also someone who is in the ecstatic blast of an elected second adolescence, if I may say so, <laughs> or rather, her first genuine girlhood. Someone who is not sure she should teach Trans 101 while she herself is, quote, still learning who she is and how she got there and who she can tr now try to be. In his latest collection, Inquisition, Kazim Ali uh, writes that, quote, in the unloving years, I had my difference to wield. This new work finds him in the comparatively loving years, minus Trump, in a kind of disorienting disarmament, with that difference no longer needing to be wielded. These poems explore a newly exposed interior and a writing that is more nuanced, vulnerable, and radically even precariously embodied. A voice that articulates a belief in the body as a spiritual solution. In a recent interview about the evolution of his work and person, Ali writes, quote, at the beginning of my publishing career, back when I was getting to know you, <laughs> during the post 9-11 period and during the military incursions in Afghanistan and Iraq, I felt some internal drive to represent Muslim culture and try to humanize the conflict. But, he says now, there are a lot more younger Muslim writers and poets with great visibility, and so I'm not a lone wolf in the wild wood of American literature anymore. He describes further how in, quote, Trump's America, I find myself wanting to pull away from broader social writing and toward the very personal. What else, he writes in Inquisition, what else is left but to be human here? Please welcome these two great humans who will read in that order of A and B, Kazim.
<laughs> hey, thanks everyone for coming. Um, can you hear me okay? Um, it's wonderful to be here. This is a poem that's called The Astronomer. Uh, if you happen to have traveled in the part of the world um, of the Eastern Mediterranean, you may recognize the city in which this poem takes place, which is the city of Haifa. The Astronomer. Adamant in his argument against winter, he plots the distance to the horizon by graphing the shape of a tree against its green, calculating the sum of the wind when yesterday is taken from it. His azimuth splendor maps the city twice in time, and he feels the drag of the tide pulling him along through the millennia into other cities, each of which existed here in this same place. <clears throat> Afternoon in sunlight, he climbs up the mountain and arrives at the flower gate leading to the garden on the slope, there being no more resistant surface upon which eternity could make its useless claim. That the prayers he learned all his life mean no more to him. Thrust up from the dark of the earth only to wither, how are flowers in any way supposed to understand God? They are no better than a human body that seeds and sprouts and dies. And even if a body were to remake itself or rename itself as different matter, what would it matter? Briefly, he wonders, is he a river then? Furiously plotting a course or the boat floating down, or the person inside. No mathematics can plot the path from a body that doesn't exist to a city that doesn't exist. The storm won't abate. Its numbers irrational, its tempers extreme, like that of another poet mathematician who lived a thousand years back, or maybe one who lives a thousand years on, drawing patterns in stone to cut for tiles, piecing together a map of the universe, seven small planets swinging their cosmography of charlatan destinies. Is that his future, or is it history unmapped? He remembers the sage, Ali, warned the astrologers to cease telling fortunes, not on account of potential infidelity, but because the book of the stars was impossibly infinite and so many bodies were yet unseen and unmapped that any divination risked planetary imbalance. And so he never knew which of those unknown constellations truly governed his kismet. Fairy prince, lonely brother, angry son. At any rate, stubborn as a volunteer, he appears in the flower beds annually. He clamors to be, along with the hyacinths, tulips, and orchids, gathered and carried to portal adornment. He broke his way through the glittering dome by guts and calculus, that science meant to plot the relationship between different objects unspeakable that move through the universe at varying speeds. In the kingdom of heaven, the belt of Orion is no belt at all, but stars separated by galaxies and light centuries. His hands on the bars of the garden gate grow dark in the dimming light. And suddenly he understands. The horizon is not the end of the world, but like God and the unfound planets, it is only the end of his knowing about the world, like that call to prayer, unspooling its rebuke over silver-leaved olives and cypresses on the way down to make its unresting vow to the blue devastation of the unbound sea. <clears throat> This is a poem called Abu Nawaz. And Abu Nawaz was a um, seventh century, half Arab, half Persian poet um, who was as fond of alcohol as he was of handsome young men. <clears throat> and uh, the sobriquet Abu Nawaz, it's like the father of 
some aspect of your personality. And so he, he was called Abu Nawaz, father of the locks. And the locks were um, the locks of hair. He, he had long, tousled girls. <laughs> so um, this is <laughs> Abu Nawaz. Halfway between the northern and southern sky hangs the constellation of Abu Nawaz, who, drunk and in love, knelt at the places rivers split to refuse all paths and offer his mosaic prayer. Unhinged, he peeled from yellow-leafed birches enough paper to fashion a bark and make for the moon, floating in the moment where one wave becomes another, amber driftwood or beach glass or lost unmapped stars reciting, we are what produces itself sanded and cast adrift, precisely at the horizon and so eternally unseen. One note emerges from the drizzle of sound, what finally somehow, though endless, does wash ashore. <clears throat> um, this poem is a, uh, homage, I guess, to Emily Dickinson, but um, formally, perhaps, it's that poem where she says, I started early, I took my dog. She goes to the sea, and the sea rises up and becomes her lover. So this is the sequel. The, she comes back out of the sea. Because in that poem, she, the sea recedes, right? But in this, I imagine her going down into the sea, and then she kind of comes back. It's called Lighthouse. When we spoke submerged, that smooth wheel of sound, some nonsense did echo, a rescue clarion. Siren and scarlet teeming, I reach into you, ashore, everything, hull, quivers, my name, I don't know. To prove unspasmed loyalty, I from shipwreck swam with only these clothes on my back and begged anchorless through the town. For one who knows the way a body floats in death, salt drunk, I stumbled, swaying down the path. I never know the way to you, for a grid is halfway between hidden and returning, a rectangular system and a veil. Someone I never yet knew haunts me through the streets. Technique is hazard to lonely evangelists. Upon night, resound the impossible, empty cello case or drunk text, then every form happens, an anarchy of sense. Salt and air, your name, bodies, borders, quiver, always still a gale, scattering intention, whose inside voice recruits a scribe to grind a lens where could silence sound a note to its incandescence, spend. Um, there are quotes in that poem. A grid is halfway between a rectangular system and a veil. Um, is uh, Agnes Martin, of course, who also said technique is hazard. Duly noted. This is a poem called His Mosaic Prayer. Trial by Magnolia. You never understand. Sane and unchanged. Strip down to rain. Cross-examined by northern lights, my want was to know you, uncovered cup of sulfured sun. Struck my bell of breath, unreachable, this ruin of effort. Muttered, perfumed profanity, unsolvable these equations, unanswerable these letters of despair, this air that airs. This is a short poem called System Error, and I think about that system error like in the computer, but I feel like we should get a system error too um, in our souls when we have like, you know, when everything's going wrong, it should just flash on the screen. System error, quiver thin, ash, wind, sudden tear, hold you in, season turn, ash and I, unbelieve, tempest, limb, lidless, vessel, errant, sin, to the self, 
no system. Uh, I'll believe, uh, oh, I wanted to read this poem that um, Christina quoted from in the uh, introduction. It's called Sent Mail. Mm. And we were talking about Aga Shahid Ali earlier in the beginning, and this poem was actually written to him. Uh, after his death, I sent it to him, and I put it in my outbox, my email outbox, because it had nowhere else to go. Lost in your outbox, collecting dust are all the messages you wanted to send tonight, the silent whisperer asking over and over, brother, do you believe in God? I sent the river and now lie down for the part where you split me from the banks one silver minute before vision when death crashes every system and you emigrate to the city that isn't on any maps. The roads which once led there have forests planted across them and still burning beneath the surface, I believe, even now, in the body as a spiritual solution. Believe that maps in error still lead somewhere. I wait for your answer, our chat window still open, huddling in the dark, because some drunk late night hooligan is banging at the door, insisting he's you, says he's come back, he still lives here, he won't take no for an answer. Mysterious little poem. Um, this is a poem that's called Origin Story, and uh, it is, you know what an origin story is? It's like in the comics, like where did Spider-Man come from? Okay, this is where, this is where Kazim, that's origin story, that's like a thing, right? Yeah, um, this is where Kazim Ali came from, origin story. Do you mind that I'm not like chatting with you in between poems, I'm just reading? Should I be chatting more? Should I be making a joke or something? It's good, okay. I know. Well, I feel like I'm just too, I'm, I'm so dour that I feel like if I crack, the poems are so dour that I feel like if I crack jokes, it'll be like <clears throat> compromise the dourness somehow. Okay, that was the, that's, all, that's all you're gonna get. Uh, origin story. <laughs> Someone always asks me, where are you from? And I want to say, a body is a body of matter flung from all corners of the universe, and I am a patriot of breath, of sin, of the endless clamor out the window. But what I say is, I am from nowhere, which is also a convenience, a kind of lie. When I was sitting in the Mumbai airport this January on a 40-hour layover, rushing home because my mother had had a stroke and was not yet verbal, I wondered about my words. Perhaps I am from my words, because my basic biography is ordinary born in Croydon to a mother and a father who on different sides of a national border were married in wartime and had to reunite in England, which was the only place they could both get to. Born at home, 76 Bingham Street, midwived, not doctored, into the world. Taken back to India when the war was over, where I came into language, and of the seven that were spoken in the house, I began speaking four of them as the same. Then to the cold Canadian north we went to a town that no longer exists on the other side of Cross Lake from Indians, other Indians, who lost everything because of the dam my father was helping to build. Then to Winnipeg, to New York City, then to Buffalo, which I think I can claim, perhaps, I can say I am from Buffalo because it is a city of poets, it is the city of Lucille Clifton. I arrived there in cold January to find my mother a little slowed down, but still self-possessed enough to cook meals for everybody as usual, even if she didn't know the names for all the spices that she was using. She does talk by the time I arrive, but slowly and deliberately, and she has to listen very careful to be able to respond. She pauses while she talks and cocks her head while she thinks. She does not criticize me or talk about my life or say anything about my wild hair. Our ordinary silence does not seem as suffocating because I wait patiently while she strains to find each word. And what on earth does it mean for me to say that I almost like my mother better this way? When she goes to her medical appointment, I get out my copy of Good Woman and comb through its lines of poetry to find the addresses in the city of Buffalo where Lucille Clifton grew up and lived. I climb into the car with a map and a journal and drive through the snow to find those places and take photographs of the empty lots where the houses once stood. Listen, I have no answer to your question. I am not kidding when I tell you 
I earned my own voice, the shape it makes in the world, holds me. I have no hometown, no mother tongue. I have not been a good son. Um, I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to read um, two more poems from this book, and then I'm going to close with a, a poem out of my journal that is fresh, only just because I feel like doing such a, a foolish thing. Um, this is a poem that's called The Failure of Navigation in the Valley. And uh, you know how the, Richard Hugo always says, like, the triggering subject and then the actual subject? So the ostensible subject is driving into a valley in the California mountains and, like, losing my GPS. Mm -hmm. And then C.D. Wright had passed away, and so I kind of imagined, like, what if my GPS had, like, you know, this? it says, like, in quarter mile, turn left. Like, had, if only C.D. had, like, recorded one a, a voice for that, that she could be, like, the voice of my GPS. So that's the actual subject here. So this is the failure of navigation in the valley to C.D. Wright. No body is fixed in position. No one can be known. Still, I am read by satellites, my tendencies extrapolated. In the mountains, I have no GPS. I don't know where to go. There are those trees. Their leaves flicker like little jewels, a whole bucket full. Darkness stares back. Are you even human anymore? I close the curtains at night, not because I think others will see in, turn left, there, but so I do not see the reflection that is pure dark. I am not afraid of anything. Oh, is that so, citizen, bear, do this place belong to you? Unseen, I wander through the thorny place of what I know that ain't it. No fear can be new, can be none, fuck. How do you spell none? I held a heavy jade pendant in my hand once, not in this valley, in another, in the range of limited human experience. How many places are there, really? I don't even have to look at the earth anymore. I just have to listen. Now, that hillbilly whisper guides me which way to turn, how far up the turn is drawling like moonshine. We're really off the grid now, making wild prayers to the green dark. Which kind do you mean? What, moonshine, grid, prayers, or dark? Does it matter? It matters. Thank God we thought of having her record this voice, every kind. Um, and so I'll read another poem for a past po poet who's passed. This is a poem that is, I wrote um, in New York City, sitting next to Sam Sachs in a, some coffee shop. And it's called Two Boys Ago. And it's a copy, it it's copies the form of Lucy Brock Broido's poem Two Girls Ago. So this is Two Boys Ago after Lucy Brock Broido. No tired queens. No ghosts coming back to strangle you with their shredded remnants of your failures. No more wishing for death. No more answering death's letters. No thousand and second night. No curse for the only president I ever truly loathed. No expiation in fire or earth. No merciful caress of the animal wounded in the street. No ear or voice. No tough, zippered stride. No more searching my skin for the bones underneath. No lying horizontally. No seeking the sun. No flounce of your hair the moment you open your mouth to begin. No beginning. No making love in the evening light on the hotel balcony. No poem to explain. No promise. In the index of this planet's history of God and body, I decline any entry. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Stephanie. Thank you all for being here uh, and for listening to, to Kazim, who it's an honor to, to hear and to have been reading for quite a while. Am I audible in the back? Yeah. Um, so I feel like the, we, just, we just keep losing major figures. And I feel like we lost a lot recently, especially around here in this particular community where those two New England writers have meant so much to so many of us, whether or not we knew them personally. I'm going to read new poems and old poems and new poems again if there's time. And this one, well, this one you'll see. Whale Watch. You've, you've heard this one? No. Oh. Whale Watch. Who, who, who's been on a whale watch? That's yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this one's a little different from the one you were on. Maybe not. Whale Watch. If you approach the surface calmly and early enough on a breezy day like today, you might see them go by. Long ago, they would stay for hours in their huge metallic shells with fin-sized bolts, some trailing chains as thick as an estuary eel. They would gather at the tip of each of their shells and look out, as if to say goodbye to a wave or to a cloud or to ice, which your great aunts might still remember. Now, all their shells are made from bones of fallen trees. For steering and propulsion, they carve branches, which they dip into the sea, then pull back, two at a time, like so. Sometimes they grunt or hiss while propelling themselves, almost as we do when we begin to grieve the woven grids they keep affixed to the largest shells work like baleen, although much coarser. They secure sea grapes, sea lettuce, kelp, and bladder rack, the basis of their diet, which they augment with herring or capelin. Take care not to swim too fast or rise too close. Some shells flip over easily, and their ability to dive is surprisingly limited, although it varies considerably. They cannot hurt us, although long ago they could. If you stay nearly silent long enough, you might be able to hear their chirps and specks, a work song, perhaps, or one of the greetings or warnings they emit at the upper limits of our hearing. Your calves will likely have more luck than you. Yeah. Yeah. Is that poem science fiction? I don't know. David, what do you think? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the idea, Hazem, at the very last poem that you read about where you're from. Um, and I don't have the same you know, background. Um, and I've been thinking a lot because I write about Washington, D.C. and electoral politics and vote in local elections. Anybody here from Wisconsin? Nobody? Cool stuff happened in Wisconsin last night. Look it up. Uh, anyway, I write about being from Washington, D.C. and being from, from white Washington. Uh, which is a thin layer of government workers and lawyers and stuff. Uh, and, you know, I'm from there, but, you know, really, uh, really I'm um, from the world of queer and trans science fiction, which used to be hard to see if you weren't looking for it. My 1980. 
It was now my younger brothers who had philosophical objections to taking a bath. After I came back from the optician, gold backs for earrings, aglets and fish scales, erasers' edges, girls' clean fingernails were no longer fuzzy, a probability cloud, but evident in separate outlines, sad as Atari pixels with their 8-bit math. I had not the means, but the active imagination, so adults said, to go anywhere. For example, into the Earth's hot mantle, in a box elder bug-shaped burrowing ironclad. I was the stowaway on an Edwardian liner who knew what the locket's ancient pictographs meant. Thanks to my prior study of Egyptology, delighting the princess by proving she was not cursed. I was also the unaccompanied minor, afraid to look down or out at the Atlantic as we began our rickety descent towards Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport. I thought of myself as omniscient as ichthyomantic. I wanted to spend the following week immersed in seafloor adventures, a nebula-winning tetralogy, or swimming as a kind of last resort. Yeah. Um, Some of you know this. Don't ask trans people to go swimming unless you really know what you're doing. They ask us lots of other things. Um, yeah, elections are great. Always vote in local elections. Um, here's a Washington, D.C. poem. Tourmalines. I used to collect them. They gather a charge under pressure. Piezoelectric, I was proud to know the word. Semi-precious when clear, pink, or green. Mine were half an inch thick, striated, unpopular, cheap enough to hoard. In science museums and gift shops, I learned to detect them amid the stacks of greater souvenirs. At the Smithsonian's cavernous Museum of Natural History, for example, on the first floor to the right in the minerals hall, Behind the apparently ravenous wooden T-Rex, I could pick out a thumb-sized sample for the price of a Super Bowl, then wait in the rotunda with my peers, sixth grade boys and girls in puffy coats. The girls put their hair up as if for a special occasion. The boys slouched, weedy, scared. The taxidermy elephant seemed to frown. A few blocks down, the Democrats under Reagan were trading away their votes. They filed like visitors into the Senate, prepared to watch the great society come down. It didn't all come down. Some of it's still around. Um, Here's a Boston poem. Suspense, a way of holding things up as the Zakim Bridge holds up the cables that hold up the nearly horizontal wedge and grids that hold the boxed-in traffic in its variable progress north to Somerville. It holds us taut. It stretches out our days. Without its gates and levels, we would slip too rapidly off and onward toward the end, which is the only end no storyteller knows or disobeys. That's actually an homage to David Blair, that like, whole poem. No, I didn't, if I had realized when I, I wrote, when I published it that it was an homage to David Blair, it would have had your name on it, and I feel like I owe you an apology. No, because it's like, I'm, I'm going to visit David Blair, I go over there, it's not about what? What? No, no, it rhymes more than yours. No, no, David writes beautifully about the sense of place, and if you're not familiar with the poetry of David Blair, I would go read it now. Um, you probably want to start with a book called Arsenville. 
What? I, I'm, I intend to, be, no, no, I'm really grateful you're all here. Um, so, I've been, uh, Christina, you mentioned uh, the, the fact that Americans are still trying to think about race. Uh, that means Americans who've had the, the luxury and, and the ridiculousness of not, of thinking we don't think about it, which means white people like me. Um, and Americans who are people of color, who are instructed to think about race every day, whether they want to or not. And I realized most of the way through writing this book, which I'm really you know, happy with, that my range of cultural references, especially if you subtract like a whole bunch of short stories by Samuel R. Delaney, is really, really white. Like, the things I like and teach and think matter to the world, I hope, is not like a set of white people. But the things that pop up in my poems, yeah. Um, and that, that means that w without sort of intending it or realizing it, I I've been participating in a way of writing American poetry, whatever the hell that is, uh, that uh, sort of cuts people who are reading me, all three of them, off, not just from African-American culture, to which I don't feel I have access uh, in, in, in some ways, I, I do in others because everyone does in, in certain ways, uh, but also from the culture and practices and art making of the descendants of, the direct descendants of people who were here before my ancestors got here on boats. So this is a poem about that. And it's also a poem of New England Place, although it's not as good as a poem of New England Place, as David Blair's. Conquered Grapes. What would it be like to belong entirely in your own body, or in your own country, or at your own address? I'm going to pause. This poem is a bit long. Everything else I'm going to read is shorter. What would it be like to belong entirely in your own body or in your own country or at your own address? It might be like these unselfconscious, tangled, each one over the next one conquered grapes, hooked as in hook and eye on the chain link fence between our driveway and the next. The populous dewy clusters hang as if lashed to so many minuscule masts or threaded and caught in the stems of their earnest commensals and competitors. Each skin gives its possessor neither shelter nor camouflage, only a violet luster that catches the eye. For such a wild varietal to thrive, let alone spread, it has to be consumed. The state seal of Connecticut designed in 1639, depicts three poles, each supporting a hefty cluster of purplish disks over Latin that means who transplants sustains. This is true. Over each, a serpentine red line, a thickening vine, though elsewhere it could read as a caducus or a dollar sign, connects the grapes it does not quite entwine. When the first Europeans to try conquered grapes made wine, they found it repellently sweet, as if a less than competent goblin or vintner had meant to intoxicate children. Christina Rossetti reference. So they drank their barrel ciders and mashed these into jam. 200 years later, Ralph Waldo Emerson thanked embattled farmers for firing the grape-sized shot heard round the world. Not many years or compromises afterward, Julia Ward Howe predicted the trampling out of vintage, if not the scavenger mutilated or putrefying corpses of Shiloh and Andersonville, who died to make men free. Unpicked, the grapes have a musky or dusky hue, especially at dusk, although their promise of easy separation from the stem is not to be trusted. Fingered, they often fall off and into the thicket they made, as if once ripe they would rather wither than give pleasure to us who have taken more than our share. 
the English Romantics preferred when they were moved to speak of revolution, a series of metaphors about dawn, the motion sensor-operated lights that hang and sometimes swing like tennis rackets from the corners of our eaves over the fence are always darkest just before they get turned on. It feels almost too long to read, but not quite. It's also an homage to the sort of Robin Schiff, Marianne Moore way of making poems by like, it's, it's basically Virginia Britannica, yeah. Um, and that's not as good, though. It's not as good, though. Yeah, uh, and, and yeah, if, if you want to know what I'm copying, like all of Robin Schiff's books plus Marianne Moore's Virginia Britannica are a good call. Yeah, no, good, good call, good call. No, I want to be Marianne Moore. Um, huh? Oh, my God, different hat, yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of Marianne Moore, I haven't read from this book for a while, but seems, this seems like a good, good place. This is, if you don't know what this is, uh, it's a series of famous poems as rewritten by uh, a, a baby. Bedtime. See, like, the last time I read this, I like, kept cracking up, and I just almost gave up, but I think I'm going to be able to get through it this time. Bedtime. I, too, dislike it. There are things that are important beyond healthy sleep habits. Approaching it, however, with the perfect contempt for it, one discovers in it, after all, ways to get more attention. Hands that can grasp, eyes that can dilate, hair that can rise in a mess. These things are important, not because a high-sounding cry of distress can be based upon them, but because they keep you in my room. When I become so frustrated as to become unintelligible, the same thing may be said as yesterday, that I see what is in my crib and do not understand. The dog attached by Velcro loops to the horizontal rail, elephants lounging, a fuzzy horse, a dinner roll, a tireless car made of metal, the inevitable sock hugging my foot like a shell that wants a snail, the baseball like an imposition, nor is it valid to tell me that you do not want to read any more board books. All of these penetralia are important. One must make a distinction, however. Dragged into my crib by parents, the result is not cuddly, nor till the parents among us can be always happy with my imagination, above schedules and triviality, and can present for inspection themselves whenever I call for them, shall we have sleep. In the meantime, if you will note, on the one hand, my focus of raw curiosity on all your movements and that which is, in the other hand, falling out of it, you may conclude that it is my bedtime. Um, so Cooper, that, those poems were all written when, like, Cooper, who's our younger kid, was, you know, one. Uh, and now they're in second, in second grade and amazing, and they ask questions. And this is a poem about one of the questions. Uh, and, and I think that's all you need. Uh, it's named after a kink song, I think. Sunny afternoon. What is the perfect life? Cooper asked trying to smash back together. They had started to melt around Cooper's sheer mittens, snowballs in the still new snowfall. An inch of white impressed like watermarks on cotton rag paper over the pen strokes of residual grass. The game that Cooper invented involves five targets called hearts. To win, you need to hit each one. One of the hearts is a stop sign, another a scarecrow still left out from Halloween. Then balding blonde wood stakes ten inches high. I don't hate nature. I only wish it were different so it would have more room for me. Snow glazes the fallen apples. My hands are cold. That wasn't the question. What is the purpose of life? Seven o'clock. Should we stop? 
I know, one more? Yeah, anticlimactic. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that poem, it's brand new. Um, do another new one? Yeah, so Christy, you're introducing both of us in different ways was about coming out. And the thing that you don't get told, at least I wasn't told, when you, I'm going to back up. Um, I'm going to back up and I'm going to talk about superheroes since you brought it up. So the thing, and I'm going to talk about mutant superheroes. I don't know. I, I honestly, I feel like David is. So we need to talk about the Terrigen Mists in Somerville because there's a lot of Terrigen Mists in Somerville. I'm going to let David go there. Okay. So I, I write about I write about superhero comics when I'm not telling you what poets to read, and I write about X Men. And the thing about X Men and the thing about superhero stories in general is that people take them as ways to talk about ethnicity. Right? People think Professor X is Martin Luther King and Magneto is Malcolm X or something, and that's offensive and wrong for a lot of reasons. Um, mutants are bad ways to think about race and ethnicity, almost always. Um, and that's why if you want to talk about being like South Asian or like Latino using mutants, you should just create a Latina mutant who's actually Latina. Um, but they're pretty good ways to talk about sexuality, and they're very good ways to talk about disability, because almost all, there are exceptions, but almost all mainstream comic book superheroes are not like their parents, right? Uh, they're the children of normal humans, right? And that means when you find out that you're a mutant or trans, you, you maybe think, you know, the people I grew up with maybe don't get all of this. There's some stuff they can do that I can't do. And there's some stuff I can do that they can't do. And that means that, that if you're thinking about identities that are about being queer, for many of us, or about being trans, or about being neurodiverse, which is a word I'd like to see in much, much broader use, uh, it's getting there. It's not just about telling like the people who already know who you are. It's about finding your people and making connections that, to other people who are like you. Cabbage whites. When we were caterpillars, we were meant to be left and could be left amid our clack of leaves, each on our own. We spent our lives in search of sugar and cellulose, or shelter and shade. Now we live out in the open, protected, if at all, by our apparent insignificance, or by the speed with which we pivot and change direction. We know we are nothing much to see beside our brighter, nobler cousins. Fritillary, Viceroy, Swallowtail eye-catching, exuberant, tansy and coreopsis, flower on flower beside our favorite weeds. And yet we believe it is better for us to be this way than any other, better to be what looks like pallid shyness from above or from the perspective of color photography, but honestly comes to us as continual effort a matter of learning our ultraviolet signatures, of willingness to fail, or else get lost in loops, jumps, lacy spin. We may not have much longer to find one another. We do expect to be found. We got along once without eyes, without wings under eaves on the unfrozen ground. At least we know now where to begin. No danger, no inclement weather, no stalking or aerial predator can make us choose to live that way again. Thanks a lot.